So in this new territory, we need new community, and that's what I hoped you talked about at lunch, is how do we, how do we live in community and be in community, and how do we get our churches into better community? And we need a new experience of God, which we'll be closing the day with. And then there's this new creativity, which I've already talked about a bit, but I want to talk about more. Meikoto Fujimura is a, an artist and is also the author of the recently released book, Art and Faith, which is one of your book options uh, on, on the pastor appreciation uh, list. His story is that one of the things that led him to Christ as an adult was his art. He recognized that the artistic impulse in him, the place where he was in the flow of painting, didn't come from himself. It had to come from outside of himself, from a creator God, and that realization took him on a journey that led him to Christ. This is one of his paintings, and it's part of a series called Grace, and he actually uses gold in his paintings. It's beautiful, beautiful work. Now, too often, particularly in the white Protestant church, we have shied away from art and artists. We've been told we're not creative, which, as I've already said, is bad theology. And at the same time, our culture is worshiping artists and musicians and storytellers. Why? Well, I actually believe it comes out of a hunger to know the creator God, but that hunger has gotten gotten misdirected. I know that this idolizing of the artist is not good, but rather than shy away from the creative, what if we took back the territory that's rightfully ours by becoming people and places of great creativity? Now, we know the creator. What would it look like if as a people we would harness creativity in order to glorify God and bring people to him? This artist is having tremendous impact. Martin Scorsese recommends his book, right? He's having tremendous impact in the artistic community because as a Christian, he's just being who he is. Now... For those of you who are a little overwhelmed about the idea of bringing creativity in your church, I'm not talking about competing with Hollywood. I'm not talking about entertaining people more. But I am talking about engaging the creativity in every human made in the image of God. How can you encourage creativity in your church that will spill out into your community? I realize that may be a significant challenge. I think about the family I mentioned earlier where imagination was suspect. And in that home, if a child drew a unicorn, they'd probably be told that they should draw something real, right? What a shame. Because we are made in the image of the creator God, and before God created the cat, the cat did not exist. The cat was not real. But God decided in his imagination that the cat must exist, and he said, and it was so. And some of you are still bitter that God created the cat. (laughs) You wonder why he just couldn't stick with the dog, right? (laughs) How can we tap into our made-in-the-image-of-God imagination? How can we be places where creativity thrives? I really just wanted to ask you that question and leave it to your imaginations and send you off to your field superintendent's room. But as I started running this by people heading into our time together, I heard over and over again, can't you just give us some ideas? So I will. But but please understand, these are just brainstorming starts to get your own, to get your thinking about your own church and your own people and your own community and your own space going. How do you encourage creativity in your people? Let's start with this. Do you know the people in your church who already recognize that they're artists? Do you have people who paint or do woodworking or play an instrument or sing or take beautiful photographs or write creatively or sculpt in clay or sew or knit or make creative videos or naturally just think outside the box? How can you breathe life into them and let them know that we need their creativity? Invite them to use their creativity for the glory of God. How about starting with talking to them about the story of Bezalel, the first person in the Bible who's filled with the Spirit of God? Ask them what they think about an artist being the first one to receive that infilling. 
Listen to what they have to say and why they think it was an artist. And then, invite them to create for God's glory. Create for the lobby, create for the classroom, create for our holiday, create during a service. And please don't tell them their artistic creation has to show a Bible story. Remember Mikoto Fujimura's painting. Could they teach a class that's open to the community? And could that class start with a reading of the story of Bezalel and a conversation about how God is the one who gives us creativity? What an amazing class that could be for people who don't know Jesus. How about having an art wall somewhere that looks like a museum and has rotating pieces? You know, put, put blank frames on a nice wall with corkboard behind it and, and pin up different artistic pieces from both, both adults and kids, right? And put a little tag next to each piece like you'd see in a museum. Make it proper. <laughs> and so next to Susie's framed drawing of a unicorn, write Unicorns and Raven, Rainbows by Susie Smith. And then ask Susie why she drew the unicorn and write that in the tag. Unicorns make me happy. Does God delight in his creation? Yeah. Is Susie reflecting the image of God as she delights in her creation? Yeah. The art wall is only one idea for how to bring creativity into our spaces. As I visit churches, I find that for the most part, our churches are updated, well-repaired, painted with current neutral colors, and have some mass-produced piece of art on the wall. They are welcoming, they are professional, they are not creative. I want you to take a look at some photos here. I think we've got a bunch of them. Here we go, just scroll through those. Take a look. Any idea where these places are? It is. It's not a nursery school. It's not an elementary school. The photos flashing behind me are from the headquarters of Google, Facebook, and Instagram. Headquarters. This is where the adults work. They understand that we are created to be creative, and that it starts with play. Maybe in the church we just take ourselves too seriously? Now, I know if you went to, back to your church today and painted the lobby like one of these things, um, <laughs> it might be a bit too much too soon, right? <laughs> but ask, where can you start? Here's an easy one. Does your children's ministry space look creative? Or does it look professional? By the way, if you don't have anyone who can paint, you can find some coloring books that you like, and you can project the picture on the wall, and if you still have an overhead projector, really old technology lying around in the dust somewhere, this will work, and you project it on the wall, and you bring in a team of people, and they just trace it. I did that with a team of volunteers at a church of 30 a number of years ago, and it worked beautifully. And again, it doesn't have to be a Bible story. It can be balloons or fish or anything that brings joy. What about bringing delightful surprise into your gatherings in order to get the childlike creativity going? Jesus said we are to be like children. Google and Facebook understand that, but do we? When we had uh, noisemakers at annual conference, I was surprised by how many people came up and said something like, oh, we could use noisemakers in church, couldn't we? Of course. <laughs> Delightful surprise is a wonderful thing. Last spring, Marsh and I were at Northgate Church, and I don't remember why, but they had an ice cream truck for uh, people to get ice cream after the service. Now, I'm allergic to dairy. It, it makes me stuffed up. And I try to avoid it. And if you'd asked me before the service, do you want to get ice cream today? I would have had the very adult answer, of course not. Dairy is not good for me. But an ice cream truck? <laughs> the kid in me said, I have to get ice cream. It was a delightful and congested surprise. <laughs> Somebody still has a noisemaker. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Oh my goodness. Do people come to your gatherings in expectation? One more thought. Uh, for those of you who do have people taking notes and you're trying to figure out how do we shift here, tell people that they can draw. 
instead of take notes. Isn't that, wouldn't that be interesting? Draw a response. Finally, let me talk about preaching. And let me go back to what is working in oral culture and how that relates to digital culture. <clears throat> back in the 1980s, a small group of Baptist missionaries began in oral culture to switch how they were teaching. Up until that point, they had taught others the way they were taught. You look at a passage, you look at the commentaries, you pick up the main points, you find the key points, and then you, you, you think linearly, right? You teach linearly. But then this small group of missionaries said, this is a storytelling culture. Jesus was a storyteller. What if we started teaching the stories of the Bible? The results were astounding. When hearing the stories of the Bible, people were coming to faith and they were quickly able to bring others to faith as they learned those stories. This started a missions movement called orality. To give you an idea of the power of story in an oral culture, let me tell you just one study. 17 North Africans were taught a sequence of 135 Bible stories which they needed to memorize. After two years, a seminary professor gave them a six-hour exam. Could they connect the stories with core systematic theology doctrines with the basic themes of the faith? Yes, they could. I guess there was a reason Jesus taught with story. Digital culture thrives on stories, whether it's gaming, movies, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, podcasts, novels, anime. Stories are which digital natives use to make sense of the world. Doesn't that sound like the North Africans in the study? We need to tell more stories, and I'm not talking about the quick stories that you're, you, you're, you use to illustrate one of your points. I'm talking about stories that take five minutes, ten minutes, the whole service, and they teach on their own. The kind of stories that people remember and that keep teaching after they leave your gathering. I'm hoping that the three stories I told you before of pastors in tough situations, I hope that that keeps teaching. One place to start is simply to tell the stories of the Bible. Tell them with details. Do your historical homework and add in the sights and sounds and smells that would have been in that place. Don't skip over them. Don't skimp on them. And it's okay if half or all of your Sunday message is a Bible story well told. Way, way too often I go to a church and someone up front says, oh, y'all know this. You know the story of Joseph. You know the story of Jesus. You know the place where it says, no. If you hope to be speaking to people who don't know Jesus, please ban the words you already know. The reality is this new territory is biblically illiterate, even in our church kids. Don't refer to the story of Joseph. Tell it and tell it well. Don't refer to the cross of Christ. Tell the people in such a way that they can see the pain on his face. If you can't tell it well, use something like the Bible Project to tell it. A number of years ago, I was leading a group of new believers, and the entire group were scientists. Engineers, college students studying the sciences, people in technology, my husband, the environmental expert. And one meeting at Easter time, I had this crazy idea to tell them the story of Easter from Mary Magdalene's perspective. And I knew it was crazy, because this group was a group full of intellectual questions. They were all brainiacs. So what made me decide to try this? I don't know, but I did. And I did this artsy presentation of Mary Magdalene sharing the good news that Jesus was written, writ, risen, and I, and I finished, and there was this long pause. And I thought, what did I just do? <laughs> and then Eric, the engineer who came to Christ when he decided to experiment with living like he believed Christianity to see if it worked, okay? <laughs> Eric, my absolutely left brain friend, said, that was fantastic. And I was a little shocked. So I said, why do you say that, Eric? And I'll never forget his answer. He said, because I, I guess I've never thought about those people being real. Tell stories. Stories that teach on their own, not stories that illustrate your point. So those are some of the ideas to get you thinking about how to embrace new creativity 
as you head into your field superintendent's rooms. So let's see, Danielle's gonna tell you where you're going. I know my field stays here. And we have some snacks for them to pick up as they go, right?